it's 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 really ironic because we were in the middle of a fundraiser, so we were actually just two weeks away from Commitment Sunday when it flooded. And we got, I think they said 25 inches of rain in 24 hours, some crazy number. Flooding that has never occurred here before. And so right away we knew that our focus had to change. And so we immediately set out to shift focus, first of all, to try to protect the homes. And so we, uh, that morning, began doing the sandbagging and just called as many people as we could in somewhat of a disorganized way and said, everybody just get out and let's sandbag. And so uh, we had, you know, hundreds of people from the church out in the community trying to keep the water out. And after the second day, the water was where the water wanted to be. And so at that point, it became a, a, a system of recovery. So on Saturday morning, I called the staff in. We all kind of had a staff meeting, we kind of assessed where we were, what it was going to look like. And, um, and from that point, different guys on staff began to take on responsibility for different areas of operation. We knew we were going to have a, a food issue. Um, we had a, a couple coming in from Texas that was going to help us get started on that. And, and the good thing for us is, as a church, we had been involved in disaster relief before. We had taken 50 people up to Oklahoma City when the tornado hit Moore. Um, we had been down with Hurricane Ike and Hurricane Katrina. So, you know, we were familiar with uh, the routine of a disaster. And, you know, I told our people, I said, I hate disasters for what it does to people and to people's lives but I love disaster relief because of what it does to churches and communities and so uh, we organized around food teams uh, mud out teams uh, we developed a prayer team we have one of our guys was liaison we knew the disaster teams from the Baptist were going to come and they were going to headquarter here but we also felt like that was something we needed to do and so we started preparing meals. We prepared in a two and a half week period, I think just under 20,000 meals. Um, and we were feeding over 2,000 people a day, um, just taking food out onto site, people coming by and getting food. At the same time, we had set up an area for cleaning supplies. People were donating cleaning supplies. They were coming by. And then we were uh, very carefully trying to organize point of need and then put the teams on the point of need. And uh, the first day we kind of struggled, kind of trying to get our legs under us and figure it out. We, uh, we discovered that you don't just send people out one at a time, but we started sending them out in squads, groups of four and five, and then groups of 10. And uh, ultimately through that process helped really hundreds of homes. Uh, we wanted to make sure that all the people in our church were, were taken care of, but we wanted to be sure the community was too. And we viewed that as part of our responsibility. I had one guy say, hey, you don't have to do meals, there's another church doing meals. But you know, we kind of saw it as a body of Christ thing because we have people that maybe physically they can't go in and mud out, but they can make a sandwich or they can cook a meal or they can put a box together. And so we tried to do that. We also had a team that started washing clothes for people uh, who were impacted and the disaster guys brought in their, their clothes washing trailer, had several washing machines and dryers, so we washed clothes. and then. We also felt like uh, that there were going to be spiritual needs, and so we, we formed a, a team of people who were going to answer the phone for spiritual prayer requests, and you know, that was one of the smarter things that we did because uh, we had a stack of, of prayer needs, probably an inch and a half thick, of people just needing prayer. And we tried to make sure, you know, when you go in, the, the beautiful thing about disaster relief is people are allowing you in their home that would never let you in their home but they're more than welcome to have you now. If you just take the time to pray, and they're so vulnerable and they're so open. Um, and, and through this, I think North Monroe, because it was a visible church, it's a fairly large church, people knew about us, but you know, they had opinions about us because people are so cynical. And I think we became something of, of the, the parish church for them at that moment. And, and they knew they could trust us. They knew that, that we cared about them. And, you know, there's that verse in Matthew where it says, they'll see your good works and glorify your Father. And it never occurred to me before, but the they in that is the non-believer, the people outside. The, you know, we're always glorifying God in the church. But when we go out and we be the hands and feet of Jesus and we're the body of Christ, the non-believers are the ones that begin to glorify God. And they began to glorify God through the ministries of this church and what was going on. 
And then, you know, we wanted to help our people because the, the hard part about the rising water is that most of the people didn't have any insurance that would cover it. And so we opted to do a, uh, 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 a fundraiser at the church just to set up a fund. And so on one Sunday morning, and we didn't really publicize it that much, we just said, hey, let's, let's take care of people who are impacted by this. And uh, we just stood the guys at the door with buckets and collected $100,000 uh, just to take care of that need, that moment. Um, so it was really an awesome thing just to see the church come together in ways that even now, I mean, people don't talk about it without kind of tearing up and without true, genuine, authentic gratefulness, uh, both inside and outside the church. You know, we were running meals down to the south side into, you know, some people lost a little, some people had a lot and they lost a lot, some people had a lot and lost a little, and some people had nothing and lost everything. And those people were the hardest hit by it. So we were bringing meals and support into those areas as well. Can you estimate about how many people you helped? Uh, man, I have no idea. I don't. I know we had about over 500 people volunteering, actively engaged in this from this church, and really at every level. I mean, I had guys that that are big time businessmen who own major businesses that employ three and four hundred people who are in blue jeans and mudding out in people's houses, uh, and and that was kind of cool to watch. You know, a college student working shoulder to shoulder with, you know, everybody, old, young, everybody engaged. I don't know how many people we helped. It, you know, we didn't keep any kind of record like that. We just, we knew how many meals we made. We knew how many homes we tried to get into. Um, but, you know, a lot of our people were just, you know, going out and doing it. Just individuals, groups of individuals. And it was so cool. And I told our church, I said, I was out the first night, we were sandbagging, and, and we were on this street called Bunker, and Bunker all went underwater. These were young families. I'm talking about guys in their 20s, got little babies. And these guys had all lost their house, and there was one guy left on the street that had hope. And these guys, even after their house was like a foot and a half underwater, they'd gone to his house. And they started fighting for his house, and they fought all night. Well, I can't hardly talk about it without kind of tearing up. But these are guys who are 26, 27 years old who, you know, six years ago, you couldn't get them off the couch to mow the yard. And all of a sudden, they turned into men that night. And they are warriors, and they're fighting the water for their buddy. And that translated back into their life group in these profoundly powerful ways of, of the connection. Uh, and guys who had been kind of what we would call a perimeter guy, a peripheral guy, Maybe he's just started life groups. Maybe he's been attending for 10 years, but he's just now gotten into a small group. And all of a sudden this happens, and now he's totally connected and assimilated, and he's a part. He's talking about spiritual things, and they're all putting it into context about the meaning of material things and the true meaning of love and service and all that. So flowing out of all that, we're back into our fundraiser, and... We just had our commitment Sunday yesterday, and they gave half a million dollars and committed, you know, another four and a half. And I mean, just an awesome place, awesome people doing incredible things.